Hey guys, welcome to another Symbolic Studies presentation. I am really stoked to be here. If someone in the chat can give me confirmation that we are live and that you guys can hear me and see me, that would be awesome. And then we can get the presentation underway. There are a lot of things to get into today, uh, tonight. So, um, you know, I think I'm just going to get right into it once I get that confirmation. But this topic is something that I am really, really fascinated with. And I've been studying for a little while now. And I've mentioned a lot of these things on podcasts and other shows. But a lot of these details I actually have not mentioned before on my channel personally. And so I figured it was probably time that I discuss some of these topics on the Symbolic Studies channel and fill you in on kind of what I'm thinking regarding these seven gates and how it relates to the afterlife process. So once again, um, if someone can let me know that things are good uh, regarding my audio and video, that would be fantastic. It is possible that someone has already mentioned something, but I just cannot see it on my end. So uh, just give me one quick moment to verify things. I always want to make sure things are solid um, in that regard before we proceed. Awesome. Okay, cool. People are acknowledging <laughs> that we're good to go. So thank you, guys. Um, so I'm going to avoid the chat uh, for the sake of the presentation. And um, otherwise, I would just get very, very distracted. <laughs> so um, I'm going to full screen myself here. I'm going to cover up how many people are watching because I've noticed that that is also a distraction for me. Uh, so there we are. So I just have to say, too, if you are here live right now, I really appreciate your presence. So there's a lot of other things you guys could be doing right now. But the fact that we are uh, spending it together is awesome. It's Friday night. Um, and so personally, I am stoked to be doing this uh, on a Friday night. And I've been really enjoying doing these live streams. I get a lot out of it and I get a buzz from it. Um, so it's been a good time. Um, right. So the presentation today is Seven Gates to the Great Beyond. And this is a thread that I've been very interested in, um, as I've been saying, over the last few years but uh, especially as of late. And so I figured it was time for me just to kind of put out all of this information and uh, get your guys' feedback on it. This is by no means a comprehensive look at uh, this subject. There are many threads to continue pulling at from here, but I think this will catch you up to speed um, with this general subject regarding the seven gates. If, in case you're unaware, uh, obviously you're watching me on YouTube, but I do have an Instagram, I do have a TikTok, I have a Twitter and a Rockfin. Uh, if you're so inclined, please give me a follow on those outlets. Also, if you get anything out of this presentation, um, I have a Patreon for general support. So I'm always looking for new subscribers and uh, I really appreciate everyone who is a current patron. Uh, that's awesome. So thank you guys. But let's get into the information here. So this is an alchemical work of art that you guys may have seen before. And there's variations on this theme as well. So um, you'll notice a seven-pointed star, right? And within each point, within each tip, you're going to see one of the traditional planets, one of the traditional seven planets. So at the very bottom, you're going to see Saturn, and let's just go to the left. You'll see Jupiter, Mars, the sun. You're going to see Venus, Mercury, and the moon. And between each point, you're going to see a sphere. And there's going to be some artwork depicted within uh, this circle. And then uh, in between the points, you're also going to see these words. So I'm not even going to read all of them. But uh, visita, interiora, terra, rectificando, etc. And so... These words are different steps in at least one version of the alchemical process. 
And so alchemy, you know, is a huge study. I consider it to be a lifelong study. It's not something that I'm claiming to be an expert in by any means, but there is a branch of alchemy that acknowledges that there are seven main phases or steps um, to the alchemical transformation process. And even these words, these words in Latin, um, when read together, it actually creates a sentence. Um, and the first letter of each word creates an acronym. So and the acronym is vitriol. And so I'm not going to get into the specifics of alchemy right now uh, with what I know, at least. And I'm not going to get into what this sentence represents right now. Uh, but there's just a lot to pull at here. So within this simple illustration, there are, you know, it's a whole course or it's a whole lifetime study of things that you can take away from just acknowledging uh, this seven pointed star, uh, the man in the middle, you know, these Latin phrases, what they represent, the different phases of alchemy, the different processes, you know, and then how these illustrations uh, relate to that process. But suffice it to say, there's clearly a correspondence with the seven traditional planets here, okay? Um, and I'm going to show you a variation on this artwork. Here you can see some of the elements are very, very similar, but there's even more detail uh, around the actual image itself. And so when I do my research, I tend to focus on the seven traditional planets. Um, that's something that I've done for a while and it makes sense for me. And I like that it's steeped in a very long tradition. Um, there's nothing wrong, obviously, with studying the outer planets, but that tends to be my focus. Sometimes these spheres, you know, uh, could be oriented in a different way. So as an example right here, they're around a symbolic world tree. And the world tree does play a part in the subject that we're going to be talking about, which is the afterlife journey and seven steps uh, to the great beyond. And so uh, here's this world tree, the seven spheres around it. And uh, I'm sure there's lots of other things uh, that we can kind of pull out from the details here that are worth discussing. But I do like the fact that it is around a central world tree. And the world tree in general, I'm probably going to do a presentation on world tree symbolism. And I think in a way, I kind of see it um, being something that I feel like needs to be brought into the fold again and needs to be understood again. Because there is a lot of powerful information associated with the world tree that has been lost that I think is worth reviewing. So you've probably seen uh, this type of artwork where it's you know concentric rings essentially. And you'll notice that I've highlighted um, seven bands that associate with the seven classical traditional planets. So the outermost uh, ring is Saturn and then it's Jupiter, Mars, etc. And so the number seven and, uh, you know, looking at artwork like this, there's just many, many different ways to interpret this. So that's kind of the main point of me showing you some of these slides to begin with is that, you know, it could be around a world tree. It could be concentric rings. It could be a seven pointed star. Um, it's been interpreted in many, many different ways. And uh, we're not going to get to all of them today, but these are a few of the basic ones that I felt like were worth highlighting. But um, the thing that they all have in common though, right, is the correspondence with the seven planets and then um, this layered or nested sort of idea with the planets. And so notice as well in this illustration that the ring closest to the center um, and the center, the sacred center is a concept that is really important uh, in this line of research as well. But the ring that's closest to the center is the moon. It's Luna. So it's lunar energy. Okay. And then the ring furthest out is Saturn. And so there's a long history associating the moon with being the first 
gate out of here. And so if you are astral traveling, if you are going and having these experiences, uh, there are traditions that suggest that it is best that you start with the moon, that the moon is like the first gateway or door out of here. I know there's some magical traditions that um, promote the idea of working with the moon first before you start working with other planets. And so there is a thread here that the moon is, uh, in a lot of ways, the planet that has the closest symbolic relationship to Earth. And I think that makes a lot of sense because we see the moon, you know, we see its changes. Um, moon symbolism is very, very deep. Lunar symbolism is very, very deep. And I've gotten into it in some of my cancer videos. Um, I know in one of my videos, I said that symbolically, we're all moon children. I do think that's true. Uh, for a long time, the moon was like the preeminent planet that determined measurement. And in fact, a lot of the symbolism associated with the moon has to do with measurement. So as an example, uh, month is really moonth, right? And so um, also words like menstruation um, come from the moon. So a lot of words that are M vowel N, M blank N, man, men, min, M-I-N as in minute, you know, there's a lot of words that are uh, associated with measurement and measurement of time that relate back to the moon. And so we do, as humans, we have this very uh, close symbolic relationship with the moon. Um, arguably, you know, um, a lot of our, the gateway that we come into this plane, this reality, which is woman, has a lot of lunar symbolism associated with her as well. And the Babylonians had this belief that we came through a gate and that the gate is cancer. Cancer is ruled by the moon. And then we exit through Capricorn, which is ruled by Saturn. So isn't that interesting that they said that we come through what they refer to as the gateway of man, Cancer, which relates to the moon. And then we exit through the gateway of the gods, which is Capricorn, which relates to Saturn. And so Cancer and Capricorn are opposite each other on the Zodiac. So when you look at it through this kind of artwork, it actually makes a lot more sense. It's saying that you go through the moon first, and then as you go through these phases, these cycles, which has uh, a planetary correspondence, you are going to exit via Saturn. The end of the line is Saturn, okay? And, you know, there's just a lot of other artwork out there that encodes um, seven either spheres seven lights, seven stars, um, in really simple, smaller illustrations. Sometimes it's seven dots. I've seen some uh, constellations that have, um, you know, the figure of the constellation has like seven dots going along their back. And so this idea of seven, seven dots or seven, um, you know, flames or seven stars, you know, it's like there's so many examples of that. And so this is just yet another example. You have seven stars in the sky. So what does that represent? You know, what does that mean? Um, I think I probably had a different interpretation of what they meant years ago. Uh, but I think that I have an updated interpretation of what it means to me now, which is what we're getting into. So there's a lot of groups that also have encoded seven within some of their primary like works of art or icons or glyphs or what have you. Uh, this is the Argentum Astrum symbol. And so it's a seven pointed star. Um, the AA is for Argentum Astrum, which means silver star in Latin. Um, and so this silver star idea is related to the seven pointed star, okay? And so notice that there's seven tips here and notice that each tip uh, has a different letter within it. And so it spells Babylon, right? And so also notice the amount of sevens that you see within uh, the inner frame of the star. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, se uh, sevens. <laughs> so uh, there are seven sevens here. 
And so that is obviously very, very strategic because the number seven has long been associated with major cycles and transcendence, as we will see here. You'll notice, too, that in a lot of star cards, um, there's a seven-pointed star. Not all the time. Um, a lot of times, actually, it is an eight-pointed star, but it's surrounded by seven pointed or seven stars excuse me sometimes the stars that surround the main star are seven pointed however some of these stars are seven pointed and so the star card has a seven pointed star in the background here um and i relate this star to the north star and so we're going to be getting into northern symbolism as it relates to the afterlife journey and as that also relates to the number seven and seven cycles and seven processes and everything else. But to me, in my opinion, when I see this star now, I just think it's the North Star. To me, that makes the most amount of sense. So here's a tombstone. And so you can see that uh, there's seven stars and all of these stars are seven pointed. Um, very interesting imagery. I've used this before in other presentations and uh, in videos and stuff. And it really, it's very striking to me. So whenever I see it, it gets me thinking. Obviously, there's an Ouroboros um, around uh, this uh, constellation here. And I think I have a pretty good idea of what they're trying to encode uh, with this symbolism. So the number seven, where do we see it, you know, in mythology? Um, how has it been used over the ages? There are so many examples. So as I said before, this is by no means uh, the definitive list or presentation or lecture about all of this. Uh, in a lot of ways, we're just scratching the surface. But seven, you know, as I've been saying, there's seven traditional planets. And each of these planets relates to one of the seven days of the week. So this is probably not new for a lot of you. So as an example, it makes perfect sense that the sun corresponds with Sunday. The moon corresponds with Monday, moon day. Uh, you can see the rest of the list here. Uh, one of the more obvious ones too, Saturn corresponds with Saturday, right? And so the number seven plays a big, big role here. So there are seven days of the week, seven traditional planets. There's seven colors of the rainbow. And there's all of these other things here, right? Seven days of creation, the seven heavens. This is basically what we're referring to. The seven seas, the seven wonders of the world. There's a lot of myths out there that um, utilize this idea of there being seven sages that basically came from the north and bestowed wisdom upon humanity. And so there's this idea of seven sages. There's seven hermetic principles as well. Uh, there's seven degrees uh, in the Mithraic initiation process, which I think is really interesting. We have lucky number seven or 777, right? If you're going to play the slots, it's always good. I think, I don't know. I don't really gamble <laughs> to hit the, the triple seven. Uh, there's a lot of other uh, myths regarding seven hills or seven mounds. If I'm not mistaken, um, this is a Roman belief as well, that it was like built upon seven hills. They're not the only one though. There are many instances of there being seven hills and that the promised land um, was built around these seven hills and that the seven hills is a concept um, that uh, basically alluded to there being a favorable sort of uh, plan here to build a, a, a city or a town or whatever. So if there's seven hills, that this is a favorable omen. And so we should build something here. We should settle here. And so this is an idea that you could look into. Uh, in the Bible, there are so many seven references, it's nuts. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven lamps. 
et cetera. So it really truly just goes on and on. And so when I see this list now and I see all of these different things, you know, um, my understanding is I really feel like it's referencing generally the same thing. And it's just the power of seven. And I've, as I've said before, you know, it really speaks to uh, transcendence and cycles and movement. And so that's why it is strongly encoded in all of these things. And this is why there are many traditions that basically say that there are seven main levels or steps to get from here and to what I've been ge just generically calling uh, the great beyond or the other side. So if you look into the Tower of Babel, uh, you will see that there are generally seven steps to the tower. And as I was putting this presentation together, uh, I came across this graphic and apparently a new a tablet was found that um, basically had an engraving of the tower on it. And what you see on the left is kind of like a cleaned up version of the artwork that's on the right hand side. But if you count, you will see seven steps um, with this tower. And so when you're dealing with tower symbolism, and I believe I have a uh, better, clearer image here. Here's another version. So seven steps, seven layers, right? Um, tower symbolism is bridging what's above and what's below. And so the idea behind building a tower or having a large obelisk or a building, what you're symbolically encoding is you are creating a bridge. So obelisks are bridge, phallic items are bridges, towers are bridges. So it's a bridge from the uh, the earthly domain, the earthly plane to the heavens, okay? And um, I'm looking into the Tower of Babel story right now and it is really fascinating. We're not gonna get super into it today, um, but there's a lot to discuss there at some point. But needless to say, seven is encoded with their tower as well. I mentioned uh, the Mithraic uh, degrees of initiation and that there's seven of them. Um, that's a really interesting sort of system as well that maybe we will get into at some point. I do have uh, a side interest in uh, uh, Mithraic traditions and whatnot and rituals, but notice that Mithras on his cape has seven stars on his cape. And so uh, this is a reference to all of the things that I'm already bringing up, but you guys are probably catching the drift already, but there is some room for interpretation. And that's what we'll be getting into here in a second. Also, you'll see images of Buddha and he's surrounded by a seven headed serpent. And so seven headed beasts or seven headed serpents that's kind of a common theme too. You can find a lot of works of art that encode and depict this. And so to me, when I look at this, once again, I think of transcendence. I think of these large cycles. Uh, I think of the symbolic bridge between earth and the heavens. You know, any excuse uh, I can take to show some William Blake artwork I will, I will do just that because William Blake, he's probably one of my favorite artists. I really love his stuff, his visual art. Um, I, I like his poetry too, but um, you know, his illustrations definitely resonate with me. And so this is his take on the Whore of Babylon uh, writing the Beast of Revelation. And so one of the things uh, with this beast is that traditionally, most of the time, you are going to see that he is seven-headed. And so if you notice, uh, there are seven heads there. And so I thought that was worth showing for a few different reasons. So again, it's kind of not unlike the previous image with Buddha and the seven headed serpent. In my opinion, the way I tend to look at it, it's a seven headed beast. Um, this quote is from an older uh, Islamic work. And basically it says that between God and creation, are 70,000 veils. When I first read that, you know, um, it definitely clicked. And I'm like, this is exactly the deal. There, there's a seven correspondence with 
what it means to live uh, on this plane in this domain and then to transcend and go to the other side. It always requires seven. And here, this is just another way of saying it, except that, you know, they're using 70,000 instead of just seven. So once again, between God and creation are 70,000 veils. And that's kind of the thing here. I really, I took a second to think about what word I wanted to use if I didn't use gate. And I think there's a lot of words that I could have used. So the seven levels to the great beyond, uh, the seven planes to the great beyond, the seven uh, veils. You know, there's a lot of different words that are applicable, but I chose to use gate and I feel like I'm, I'm, I think that was a good decision. Uh, there's something about it that just kind of like, at least for me, there's a resonance to it that just makes a lot of sense. But um, basically, I'm just saying that veils is also very, very appropriate. Okay, so this quote sums up a lot of information. And it comes from an author. His name is Peter Lavenda. And... I'll show you the book this comes from in just a moment. Um, but he has been instrumental in helping me unlock some of this information. And it's because he writes about it in a very straightforward sort of way. He's a modern author. And I guess this is just uh, this quote where it came from the book that he uh, wrote about this information. It's kind of gone under the radar. Some of his other work is definitely more popular. Um, but this to me really helped solidify a lot of things that I had been thinking about. And when I was doing, uh, the prep work for this presentation, I came across this quote and I'm like, this has to go in there. So the recurrence of certain themes, the North, the pole star, the number seven, the axis Mundi ascent and descent to and from the North is certainly suggestive, suggestive, excuse me of a baseline idea concerning the relationship between humanity and divinity. And so he's saying that, you know, basically the ascension process, uh, you know, if you look around the world, which he did, and if you look at all of these esoteric texts from various religions and how they interpreted the afterlife journey, many times it involves the North, the pole star, the number seven, the Axis Mundi, which if that's not a term you're familiar with, um, you know, I would get familiar with it because it's definitely something I will be talking about more uh, moving forward. I've mentioned it in a few videos just very briefly, but it's this concept that there is a, a pole from Earth to the heavens and it exists at the North Pole. The North Star is symbolic of this pole. Um, and so the world tree the world pillar or world column is very much symbolic of this axis mundi, you know? And so this is the bridge that you take to go to the other side. So that quote, excuse me, I don't think I finished uh, the axis mundi ascent and de descent to and from the North. Okay. You got it. <laughs> so moving on, uh, this is the book. So this is stairway to heaven. Uh, Chinese alchemists, Jewish Kabbalists, and the art of spiritual transformation. So you'll probably recognize the artwork because I showed it earlier. Um, you know, and it basically is getting into ascension material. What different esoteric groups um, and what different religious groups, how they interpreted the ascension and descension process. And what do you know? A lot of times it involves the number seven. Uh, it just shows up all over the place. And he even gets into like, you know, uh, the Dogon spiritual belief system. He gets into voodoo. Uh, he gets into some Eastern stuff that is really fascinating. And he's just, you know, bringing together all of these threads um, saying that, you know, Northern symbolism tends to play a part. Um, he calls it stairway to heaven. And so it's this idea that, you know, at the North, exists uh this symbolic stairway that souls take to ascend to the other side and so it's a fascinating read um for a lot of different reasons so i appreciate the fact that he put it out so if you're interested in this topic specifically this is like one of the easiest books that i've read uh, on the topic and just puts everything together very nicely and concisely 
he even starts off the book, the introduction. He just shows <laughs> like the Big Dipper and the North Star. So this is the thing that we're going to be getting into is the seven stars that I was referring to. You know, some people might interpret them one way. Now, with enough research under my belt, I associate them very much with the Big Dipper, which is Ursa Major, which is very close to the North Star or, uh, you know, it's often called Polaris or the Pole Star as well. So I put this here just to symbolically show seven dots. And if you see seven dots, seven stars in a work of art, how would you interpret it? What, what do you see? As an example, with this uh, work here, you know, there's seven stars and each of these seven stars has seven points and it's around an eye. And at least this caption here, which is cut off, it says that it is the eye of God. Well, if you saw the, those seven stars, you might just immediately interpret them as being the seven traditional planets, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but there's more to it than that. A lot of people would associate it with the Pleiades, which is just above Taurus. And so oftentimes the Pleiades is called uh, the Seven Sisters. And so there's a fascinating amount of overlap with what people say about that constellation and what I will be saying about Ursa Major and uh, its companion constellation, Ursa Minor. And so I think that this would actually be worth uh, decoding further at some point, the overlapping symbolism between the Pleiades and uh, Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. So my personal opinion is that attributing it to this constellation um, it's actually, in my opinion, it's not as harmonious as it is when you attribute it to Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. I think Ursa Major and Minor are kind of the lost references, if you will. And I think that a lot of people in today's world would probably immediately associate it with the Pleiades. And, um, you know, on one level, I really don't think there's anything wrong with that. But on another level, it's just it's not as... Um, the, the system is not holistic in many ways. Um, Ursa Major and Minor, though, it appears as though when the ancients were referring to, you know, uh, these types of um, stars, seven stars, a collection of seven stars, what they were really referencing was not the Pleiades, but they were referencing Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And so what you see here on the right hand side, you will see uh, these are also called the Big Dipper and Little Dipper. So that's what most people know them by. And it is amazing. It's it still blows my mind, to be honest. It's incredible how much esoteric um, information there is about the dippers. And I've noticed the dippers since I was a child. You know, they're one of the most easily discernible constellations in the sky. And one of the reasons why is because they are circumpolar. So they revolve closely around the North Star. And so because of that, for a large portion of the world, they never dip below the horizon line. So as an example, the Zodiac, you know, it's all solar based. And so it's based on the path of the sun. And so um, if I go outside and I look at the band of the Zodiac, I'm only going to be able to see a handful of constellations. All of the other constellations are going to be below the horizon. So it's my understanding that Ursa Major and Minor, being circumpolar, um, are visible to 90% of Earth's population including some uh, very, very significant, important countries in history like India and China. And so you have to be pretty far south in order to not see them. Uh, but most people live above that line where they actually can see them. So they've been encoded in a lot of different myths over the ages and for very, very good reason. And so Ursa Major, once again, is on the right. Ursa Minor is on the left. And the star at the tip of the handle of Ursa Minor is the North Star. So this is what everything revolves around in the heavens, in the sky. So if you took a camera and you did a time-lapse photo of what's happening in the sky and you're pointing it towards the north, 
um, you're going to see a streak of stars around it. And it's all going to be revolving around the North Star. And so the North Star is a symbolic hub of the wheel. It's what everything rotates around. So this is a very, very important concept that I think for a lot of you maybe is, um, you know, just like you've heard it before. So this is kind of a review. But if you're not familiar with this concept, um, there's a lot going on there that's very, very significant and very deep and important um, to recognize. So this is just an image, uh, a symbolic image of the North Star. And so this is what I was talking about. This is the streak, you know. And so in the middle there, you will see one star, and that is the North Star. And everything else around it is rotating around this central axis point, which is the axis mundi. Um, and so in a way, too, it's like, think of an axle. Think of the chariot wheel, the hub of a wheel. So this comes from the Box Saga. So it's a book by Carl Borgen. Some of you might be familiar with the Box Saga. Uh, it's an interesting history to say the least, but one of the reasons why I actually read it, I have it here. So there it is, the Box Saga by Carl Borgen. Uh, I pretty much read it, noticed that there's a world tree, you know, on the cover. So very, very significant. This Axis Mundi, once again, uh, is connected to the idea of a world tree. And so I read this book basically for Northern symbolism because I'm such a nerd for it. I love it. And um, it has been, you know, it's kind of like the gift that keeps on giving. Um, I feel like it's unlocked a lot of esoteric secrets for, for myself. So uh, I read it for that reason. And I wasn't surprised to see this, but, you know, they explicitly say in the box saga, the soul flies through the air to the North Pole upon death. And so I thought that was interesting. They are not the only group, uh, these uh, older heathens or whatever, ancient heathens, like they weren't the only group who thought this. A lot of people have thought this. Um, and so even there's people who um, they're part of a group or a culture that promotes this idea and they're not even aware that this is what is being encoded in their work. And whatever it seems to be i wouldn't say a universal concept but man there's a lot of evidence that suggests that a lot of ancient groups had this exact same belief that you go to the northern sky upon death you go towards uh ursa major and ursa minor which each has seven stars okay upon death that the stairway to heaven exists and it takes you to the north. So Ursa Major and Minor, there's so much to get into here, but we call them dippers right now. So they're basically vessels. But Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, it means the great bear and the little bear. So if you actually look at uh, modern star maps, the illustrated kind, you will see bears. So you'll see like a mama bear and then a little bear. They've also been referred to as plows, which is very interesting for a lot of different reasons. They've also been called wagons or chariots. So notice there's a movement theme kind of going on here. A plow moves and then a wagon moves, a chariot moves. Uh, chariot symbolism we'll be getting into a little bit later in this presentation, but I, of course, think about the chariot wheel turning and the uh, the axis, the hub of the wheel being the North Star or the axis mundi. Uh, it's also been referred to as uh, the Ursa Major, at least, as the thigh of the bull. And so we'll be getting into that, too, or the thigh of set specifically. There's a really interesting thread that associates these constellations with blades, knives, or swords as well, which we won't be getting into today. But that's something that I've seen repeated multiple times. Also, which actually there might be an opportunity to talk about the sword thing because <laughs> that is coming up uh, in a different way that uh, I wasn't expecting to make that link here. But um, the sword element, you know, it's kind of symbolic of uh, the Axis Mundi as well. And so I've even heard um, 
Ursa Major and Minor be referred to as razors or a primitive word for razor, essentially something very, very sharp. So I, th I think that's intriguing as well. Okay, so also a new thread that I've picked up on recently is they've been referred to as scales, which we're in Libra season, right? The scales. And so to me, that kind of blew my mind. We'll be getting into that. Um, but like I said, today, most of the time, they are referred to as the dippers or the vessels. And here is a sky map. So you can see like where they're at <laughs> in the heavens. Ursa Minor, once again, the tip of the handle is Polaris. So this is what everything revolves around. Everything's turning around this central point. Um, and then you can see Ursa Major just below. And there are groups, by the way, esoteric groups and older groups that considered Ursa Major and Minor to be an early uh, sky clock, basically. So instead of following the Zodiac and what's happening with that, they were following the rotation of Ursa Major and Minor around the pole star. And so they figured that at certain points when it was rotating around the central star, that it was an opportune time to do different things, which I think is very, very fascinating. This is an older sky clock, Ursa Major and Minor. They're sometimes referred to as the imperishable stars. And it gets into what I was referring to earlier regarding the, um, the whole circumpolar thing. So they're always there. So they're always present. So the northern sky has been associated with many, many things. Um, but it has definitely been tied to um, the throne of God and also goddess symbolism. So both uh, God and goddess symbolism are very much heavily tied to uh, the north star and the, nor the northern sky. And in part, the reason why is because they're always visible. You can always count on them. You know, they're always going to be there night after night after night, depending on where you live. But like I said, most of humanity uh, has been able to see them night after night like that. Right. So this is a diagram for a ritual called the pace of you. So I'll just read the little caption here. The Big Dipper showing the Chinese terms of the pace of you and the planetary symbols of the ritual of the walking. And so this is an Eastern system, an older Eastern system that basically um, encoded the uh, Ursa Major constellation and the seven traditional planets in their ascension ritual. So. Like I was saying earlier, you know, the moon is a gateway. It's probably the first gateway. It seems as though it's the first gateway. And so you start down below where it says clarity of Yang. You see a little moon symbol and then you move to Mercury and then you move to Venus, etc. And then the celestial gate, the final gate is Saturn. And so Ursa Major, these seven stars, people associated with ascent. And ascension because it was so close to the northern sky and not only is there one dipper made of seven stars there's also a second dipper made of seven stars that literally is part of um of the pole star it, it it's right there it's the the tip of the handle once again is the pole star so rather a better way of saying it would be the pole star is part of that constellation so these constellations have been revered and they've been understood as being, again, um, very close in relationship symbolically to the stairway of heaven. And so this is uh, an ascension ritual tracing with this walking, with this pace of you, um, each star in Ursa Major and each star corresponds with one of the seven planets. And then that's how you get out of here. I don't know the specifics beyond that. I would love to know more. But I found this diagram in the gates of the Necronomicon by Simon. So I went down a Lovecraftian rabbit hole because I needed to know, uh, I need to know more. I needed to learn more about uh, Cthulhu and Lovecraft and what he was encoding and everything else. 
And I got really interested because I was very surprised that there is Northern symbolism baked into the Lovecraftian mythos, which I did not see coming. And I've done shows on other podcasts um, about this, but I have not talked about it on this channel. And so notice that there are seven stars on this cover. That is Ursa Major. So the gates of the Necronomicon. So what this book is saying essentially is um, kind of what I'm laying out here is that the Northern sky is a key to astral travel and to ascension, um, including the afterlife process. So there's a lot of material out there um, that says that, you know, this constellation is a gateway. This star is a gateway. This planet is a gateway. And honestly, I don't really disagree with that because I think there's something to all of that. And so, you know, I've heard that for many, many years, but my updated personal opinion about all of this is that there is a preeminent gateway that has a deep, deep tradition associated with it. And it correlates with Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, the North Star, and everything that uh, kind of comes with that. And so here's this book about the Necronomicon, the gates of the Necronomicon. And this is what they're getting into in this book is that Ursa Major can be used as uh, an ascension tool, especially depending on where Ursa Major is in the night sky as it relates to the North Star. So this book is really, really fascinating as well and helped me put together uh, some of these pieces. So here's a Masonic tracing board. Very interesting <laughs> that uh, you see a ladder going to the heavens and what's at the end of the ladder? It's a seven pointed star. So I this is not a mistake. This is very strategic for all of the reasons that I've already brought up and we'll continue to get into here. So I'll just say, you know, I think that a lot of esoteric groups, one of the things that they're passing down to each other is how to die properly and how to ascend, um, you know, accordingly and what that looks like. And to me, that is very, very intriguing because I think that by and large, we look at death in a very strange sort of disconnected way now but there were a lot of groups that took it very seriously like you know life after death the afterlife journey what does that look like um you know there's a science behind it you know there's symbols behind it there's a tradition behind it and it encodes all of these things that i'm bringing up so here's a work of art where you can see the seven heavens you know so you can see a terrestrial earthy sort of existence down below and then just above you see these seven heavens notice that there's a little ladder that is going towards uh, the first layer there the first heaven i also think it's really interesting that a lot of older mazes um, encode seven as well and so um, there's seven layers as an example to get from the outside to the interior part of the maze, what I would call the sacred center. And so once again, seven being symbolic of transformation of cycles, et cetera. So from the exterior to the sacred center, which definitely has a correspondence with the North star and everything else, um, you know, there are seven layers that you have to get through in order to get to the sacred center. And so this is partially what this is being uh this is partially what's being encoded within a maze like this right so earlier i said that sometimes ursa major um is referred to as the thigh of a bull or the thigh of set and so this is the dendera zodiac and uh, i love looking at this thing there's so much to chew on and take away from it and uh you'll see that there is this bull's thigh you know in the northern sky here. This is a reference to Ursa Major, for sure. 
So here's one uh, rendition of the bull's thigh. Sometimes you'll actually see this thigh with seven stars um, drawn inside of it as well, just to kind of further hit home what that's all about. Here you can see a thigh of a bull is being delivered to a pharaoh. Um, Ursa Major, turns out, was part of some of their afterlife rituals when a pharaoh was going to die or um, after he had deceased. So um, my understanding is that this is probably connected to that. That's why they're referencing Ursa Major, because this is where the soul goes upon death, or at least many people thought so. And, you know, it's fascinating because these constellations, um, because they've been associated with many things, it's like there are tools and objects and symbols that are kind of like proxy symbols to reference Ursa Major and Ursa Minor. And so this is one of those tools. This is one of those symbols. So this is known as the ads tool. So my understanding is this is a very simple woodworking tool. But notice that it looks like the number seven, okay? So the same way we just looked at artwork where a person was carrying the thigh of the bull, you will also see artwork where the ads tool, and so this is A-D-Z-E, if you care to look into it, where the ads tool or variation of the ads tool um, is being used ritually for an afterlife uh, ritual. So notice that you can, it doesn't take, much stretching of the imagination to see how the basic shape of the ads tool and even the number seven itself kind of looks like a dipper. Okay. I think this is very, very interesting uh, for a few different reasons because it's all just kind of syncretized. So here's an ads tool, you know, um, and it's being presented to the mouth of this pharaoh. This ritual is called the opening of the mouth ritual. I think it's very intriguing too that the eyes have been like scratched off or chipped off or something. Um, I think that was done for a reason because this other image, the exact same thing is present. So I don't have the, uh, the answer to what that's all about, but um, I have several hunches, but I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, both of these Pharaohs uh, have their eyes kind of scratched off. So here you can see another image of an ads tool being presented to the Pharaoh's mouth. So once again, this is in relationship to Ursa Major and Ursa Minor, the Northern Sky and Ascent Upon Death. So if you look at the night sky towards the Northern Sky, and if you look at Polaris, the pole star, and if you acknowledge uh, the Ursa constellations revolving around it, Ursa Major, if you look once every uh, few months, you will notice that it circles the uh, the pole star. And if you just take a snapshot, like once a season of where it's at, it actually creates a swastika. Okay. And so this is my understanding of swastika symbolism. That's really where it comes from. It comes from Ursa Major going around the pole star. Uh, and if you look once a season, this is something you will see. And so also notice that, um, you know, the edge of the vessel part of uh, the dipper always points towards uh, the North Star. So that's one way that you can kind of tell where the North Star is. If you know where Ursa Major is, um, then you know where the North Star is. And so here you can see that uh, it doesn't, once again, take like a big stretch of imagination to see how this would be the case. And this symbol is so beautiful. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll talk about it more at a certain point, but uh, it's a very holistic symbol. It's really, um, it encodes all of the things that I'm basically saying. So notice that each arm even looks like a seven, you know? So my theory is that literally the number seven comes from the swastika, which comes from Ursa Major, which has seven stars to it. This is the shape of the number seven. The number seven shape, when you uh, draw the number seven or use it, uh, you are actually referencing Ursa Major, in my opinion. 
once again, the ads tool and how similar it looks to the number seven. Well, it's interesting, you know, because the seventh card of the major arcana is the chariot card. And I'm a cancer. So, you know, anything cancerian I'm all about. It resonates with me. It clicks, uh, including the chariot card because it corresponds with cancer, right? And so what have I been saying about the number seven? Cycles, transcendence. And then the seventh card of the major arcana is the chariot. And I've been talking about the wheel, right? And how um, if you look into the night sky, you're just going to see all of the stars revolving around the North Star. So the hub of the wheel and the chariot wheel itself is a metaphor for the churning of heaven. And so this is what partially this card encodes. And so there's a lot to get into with this card. But also notice the uh, the red top right on the shield at the front of the chariot. Um, this is symbolic of the same churning that I'm kind of talking about. And the four uh, posts or pillars that surround the charioteer uh, are symbolic of many different things, including, um, you know, the uh, four cardinal directions, the fixed signs, um, things like that. So the number four associates with sacred uh, center symbolism, because if you're standing anywhere, there's at least four directions. You know, you're looking north, east, south, or west. So the number four um, and the circle and the sacred center, there's a whole correspondence there. Um, but these four pillars are very much symbolic of um, kind of the pillars that hold up the heavens in a lot of ways, but also the four main directions, the four elements, things of that sort. So we should probably do a four uh, presentation at some point because there is a lot to get into with that. But notice that on top of his head, you know, in the middle of these four pillars, underneath the canopy of stars, underneath the Roman numeral seven, uh, this star to me is symbolic of the North Star. So that's why it's in the middle of the canopy. That's why it's associated with seven. Um, it's because it's symbolic of the North Star. And then by extension, right, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, etc. So to me, my updated opinion about the chariot card, which I'll get into, I believe it's this next slide, right? So th this is pretty traditional. You know, uh, this is the Barbara Walker version of the card. Um, my updated opinion is that the charioteer, you know, there, there's so many different ways of looking at what he represents. But what I'm inclined to think now is that the charioteer and this chariot is symbolic of the journey to the heavens, the journey to the other side. So um, I've read before that the path of the charioteer is the path of death. So if you are born, you are going to die, <laughs> you know, uh, at least physically, materially, right? So if you come through the gateway of cancer, you will exit through the gateway of Capricorn, the gateway of the gods. You know, that's just what happens. So birth, maturation, decline, um, you know, birth and death are just two sides of the same coin. Um, and so when you're dealing with journey symbolism and you're dealing with the horse, you're dealing with the chariot, you're dealing with the boat, um, you are dealing with symbols that are very much associated with the psychopomp. And the psychopomp is the guide of souls. So he will take you to the other side. So there's a, a belief that you need a guide in order to transition uh, accordingly, appropriately. That you need someone who has traveled there before and knows their way around. And so the charioteer on a deep esoteric level, I believe, is encoding psychopomp symbolism. And so once again, journey travel symbols like the uh, like the horse, you know, Sagittarius, as an example, one of the older versions of Sagittarius, it's a Babylonian version. Um, he's called Pablo Sag, and they associated him with being a psychopomp. 
So he was a guide of souls. So he would take people to the other side. Uh, Christ is kind of, uh, not kind of, he is a psychopomp symbol too, in my opinion. So he's a guide of souls. He has his flock. He's the good shepherd, you know. But if you really, really want to dive into that subject specifically, which again is uh, the gift that keeps on giving, I can't get enough of it. Look into Mercury and look into Hermes and their role as being guides of souls. So the reason why I bring this up and this card specifically is because Barbara Walker did something really slick because I think she understands. And I tend to bring her up like, you know, at least once a stream now because I just appreciate the hell out of her. But she put the symbol for Mercury on the chariot because I think she gets it. I think she knows that esoterically the charioteer and the chariot is uh, symbolically the guide of souls. So it's believed that there's a few things maybe that are required in the afterlife journey. One, you need to understand uh, the lay of the land or a map, you know, what these different levels are at the very least. Two, you need a vehicle to travel. And this gets into chariot symbolism because, um, you know, people refer to our auric field or energetic body sometimes as the Merkaba, and that means chariot. So we are unto ourselves chariots symbolically because we travel and we journey right in this life. And so when it comes time to actually transcend or ascend, we use our energetic body to travel um, through these different processes and these different levels to the other side. And there's a whole branch of Jewish mysticism that is like completely centered around all of this stuff, which we'll get into either in the next slide or shortly thereafter. But that's kind of my updated opinion about the charioteer and what he represents. It's the journey of death. So esoteric Jewish mysticism. Okay, so admittedly, there's a lot I need to learn about these different branches of mysticism. I may not even be saying them properly. I probably won't be. But uh, let's just call it hekalot. Maybe that's appropriate. Maybe not. Hekalot. Uh, it means palace. And then Merkava. Uh, I said Merkava earlier. Merkava mysticism. This is a reference to um, the chariot. And so in these branches of esoteric Jewish mysticism, there is a belief that you can ascend via the seven palaces or the seven chariots. Um, I believe there is also an understanding that this chariot will take you through these seven levels. So this is something that is brought up in the Stairway to Heaven book. And so I just think it's really interesting that, um, you know, there is this uh, Jewish, esoteric Jewish branch of uh, looking at um, ascension. And they also encode the number seven with their palaces and with their chariots. And as we just looked at, the chariot card is the seventh card in the major arcana. And here, you know, if you look at traditional images of the chariot or of the palace, um, it almost, it looks like, it looks like both. It's actually, I just Googled chariot, but it kind of looks like a palace too, you know? So uh, there is this other belief uh, that I, I think that more than one group has adhered to and has used. Um, and it's the idea that you can live in this domain, live in this reality, ascend or transcend via these ascension rituals, and basically do work in the heavens. And so this is one of the things that they were doing um, with this, uh, with these mystical practices, is that they were leaving their body, and they were going to a palace or a temple in the sky, using their Merkava, using their chariot, and they were studying they were congregating they were doing things in the heavens 
So uh, this is a branch of information that I find absolutely fascinating. Uh, one of my buddies, uh, Juan from the Juan to Juan, Juan Han Juan uh, podcast, he gets into some of this stuff in some of his shows. And so he has a good thread on uh, what this is all about and how different groups interpreted this. So there are groups out there that once again, leave their physical body to study and do things elsewhere, symbolically in the heavens, using some of these ascension techniques. So here, just another way of uh, showing you guys the seven layers, you know, to the heavens. As though, you know, we haven't gone over that before. Well, you know, what's really intriguing? Libra is the seventh sign of the Zodiac. And so there are a surprising amount of threads that relate what I've already discussed with this sign, with Libra. As an example, so we're talking about septenary symbolism, sept, you know, this is a reference to seven and Libra starts in September. It's the seventh sign and it starts in September. Septenary, once again, S-E-P-T. This is a reference to seven, uh, like the septagon. So the septagon is the seven pointed star or shape a uh, seven cornered shape that I've been showing. So that is a septagon. So very, very interesting that the seventh sign starts in September. September, the name itself is a reference to seven as well. And one of the threads that blew my mind recently is that, and I'm still doing research on it, but it's this idea that there are uh, star maps that supposedly I'm, I'm i'm still looking into it but a couple of my re resources has uh, brought this to light for me that libra used to be depicted not as scales but as the tower of babel and so once again the tower of babel having seven steps or seven layers to it you know and um and as we've gone through all this information, now you probably understand why that would be more than intriguing. And as I also said earlier, Ursa Major and Minor were once known uh, in the East. My understanding is that uh, at one point in ancient China, Ursa Major and Minor were referred to as the Jade Scales. And so instead of dippers or bears or whatever, they saw it as scales. And when I looked up, you know, what older, simple jade scales looked like, I was surprised that it looked like this, that, you know, usually, right, we think of the two pans balancing out. And here you have one pan and then you have the counterweight. And so to me, it would make sense that the large pan would be symbolic of Ursa Major and then the small counterweight would be symbolic of Ursa Minor. And the scales show up in afterlife rituals. So this is the weighing of the soul's ritual, right? And so your heart was weighed against a feather. And not just any feather, but this is the feather of truth or the feather of ma'at, who very much corresponds with Libra. And so the heart was weighed against the feather. Your heart needed to be lighter than the feather for a favorable ascension, essentially. If it was heavier, it was unfavorable. Right. So there are multiple myths, basically, that use scales just after someone has passed to either weigh their karma symbolically or to see, you know, how light or heavy they are um, energetically. And so that's to me kind of what this represents. It's like if you have if you're weighed down and you're living really heavily, you know, you're not living lightly. Um, then you're going to have a harder time getting out of here. And I've mentioned this before, but, you know, there's this idea or thought that the ghosts that kind of stick around on earth, you know, something has weighed them down. There's something that they haven't gotten. Um, there's something that they haven't gotten over. There's something that uh, basically traumatized them and is keeping them here, 
you know, and so they feel as though there's unfinished business here. And so they are courted to this domain. And so they stay here. Right. So I think there's kind of like by extension, you could almost uh, bridge the gap between, you know, that idea and kind of what's going on here. Um, but the scales being this thing that determines whether or not you're going to ascend favorably or not, I think is really, really fascinating. And the fact that Ursa Major and Minor were thought of at one point, the scales to me is very, very intriguing. So obviously you uh, tend to see Lady Justice with the scales. So, um, you know, there's a major correspondence here with the law, with truth and illusion, uh, with karma, as I was saying earlier, and everything that may or may not represent, uh, with handing out justice. Uh, many times, most of the time, it's a woman holding the scales. And so here she has the scales that are impartial, they're going to weigh things um, accordingly. And then the sword is kind of like the decisive sort of uh, object. It, it makes a decision, you know, and so it hands out justice, I guess you could say. And it's interesting, too, because, uh, you know, Libra just has this natural balance um, correspondence with it, as obviously the scales would imply. Um, so. When we first enter into Libra, there's equal parts day and night. So the top six signs are symbolic of the light or day side of the zodiac. And the bottom six signs are symbolic of the dark or uh, night side of the zodiac, right? And so when we enter into Libra, the, uh, the sun is starting to recede. And so it becomes equal parts day and night because we're moving from summer to fall. Right. And so there's this balance. Right. And so also we are transitioning towards the underworld. And so we are tradition. Uh, we are transitioning to the dark side of the Zodiac. And so what are the odds that Libra would be associated with all these things that I'm bringing up? And then it's also bringing you to the dark side of the Zodiac. Symbolically, it's bringing you to the underworld, you know, and uh, this is all very much in relationship to the sun and uh, the journey of the sun and when there's a peak sun and when the sun is at its lowest, you know, and everything else. So that to me is really intriguing as well. And then also just have to say, you know, um, Scorpio is coming up next and there's a lot of death symbolism associated with Scorpio. And so this is when Halloween um, occurs this is when a lot of the Day of the Dead uh, festivals and, and stuff uh, occur as well. I've heard that it used to have a, a different date, you know, many years ago. But the Day of the Dead for most people and Halloween, they both occur during Scorpio. This is when people believe that, you know, the veil was thinning and you could talk to the other side or you can give messages or gifts to people who have, um, you know, transitioned and already passed on. So, uh, yeah, suffice it to say, there's a lot of underworld sort of transcendental stuff going on with this lower half here. Um, but I think it's intriguing that Libra kind of brings that all in. Libra is very much associated with this as above, so below concept. And so I think of the sine wave. And so I think of just waves in general. I think of frequency. Um, but I think of, you know, what goes up must come down. And I think of this natural balance uh, with the pans, with the scales and always going up and down, uh, adjusting to what they're actually weighing. And so um, I think that this really speaks to pretty much just kind of like what reality is all about and what life is all about, because again, we're all going to transition one day. And so there's just, you know, uh, there's peaks and valleys to this whole entire thing. And there's this natural equilibrium and there's this natural balance that always wants to play out. And so, um, if we've transitioned here, then, uh, we're going to transition out of here as well. And it seems as though the transition here, there's seven steps to it and the transition out of here, there's also seven steps. So uh, I said it earlier, but you know, the gateway of man corresponds with cancer, which most of 
cancer takes place during July, the seventh month. So there's lots of interesting things here that, um, you know, perhaps we'll talk about more down the road, but I just wanted to bring up this sine wave as above, so below correspondence, right? So it's interesting because G, the letter G is the seventh letter of the alphabet, right? And I'm talking about as above, so below. So I think one of the metaphors for Libra, the seventh sign, is that there's this balance between heaven and earth and what's going on here. So in a way, you know, we tend to think of scales as being horizontal like that, but I think you can flip it and look at it vertically and that there's this balance between heaven and earth with what's happening in the cosmos, in the sky, in the heavens, in the stars, and what's actually happening here in our everyday life, in the terrestrial sort of world. And um, I think that that is one of the natural balances. And I think that in many ways, you can kind of uh, interpret Libra this way as well. It's a balance with many, many different things, many polarities and dualities and stuff. Uh, I think, you know, um, Libra kind of connects to, right? And so it's interesting to me when I see the Freemasonic uh, compass and square, you know, a lot of people associate the square, the lower portion with Earth, which makes a lot of sense. You can look into that. And then the compass with heaven, the heavens, right? And so the compass is used to determine angles, to measure angles. Uh, some people say that there is a relationship with angles and angels. Uh, it's just a flip, right, of uh, some letters. And then also the pivot point of the compass is kind of symbolic of uh, the North Star. And if that's the center of heaven, then there's all of these angles and math uh, that can be branched out from that central point. Um, so if this is the case, if the compass is heaven and then the square is earth, which you can read about, I think it's fascinating that the Freemasons put G right in the middle, which again is the seventh letter. And so to me, it's symbolic of this bridge that I've been talking about the whole entire time. Uh, this seven layered bridge between this domain and what's happening on the other side, or as I've been referring to it, or the name of this presentation is at least, uh, the great beyond. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, I think the infinity sign is kind of appropriate because I think what the deal is here is that we're just continually going through this transition, the seven layers there and the seven layers back. And so if you come here, I think it takes seven steps. It seems as though symbolically that is the case. And then when you exit, there are also seven steps. And so we're just going through this constant loop, this infinity loop, uh, seemingly, you know, and I'm open to other ways of looking at it. I'm actually not very dogmatic about that. But to me, I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think of the path of the fool. And so I think the path of the fool uh, encodes both life and death. And so the fool is going to go on his journey and then he's going to eventually reach the universe card or the world card. And then he's going to come right back again. So the path of the fool encodes both life and death. And I'm really starting to think too, that the major arcana has a lot to do with the afterlife process. And so that's something that I've been thinking about a lot lately. Um, maybe I'll make a presentation about it, but I'm wondering if the major arcana, you know, actually encodes how to die. Uh, or perhaps it encodes some of what we've been talking about here. Um, so that's a conversation for another time. But the path of the fool, you know, I think is all encompassing. So, you know, it's life, death and everything in between. So that's what I have for you guys. Hopefully you got something out of that. I think I hit most of everything that I wanted to uh, discuss. So once again, if you got something out of this and you appreciate it or you want to support, uh, there's many ways to do so. You can go to symbolicstudies.com. You can buy a study packet. It's a name your price thing. You can sign up for my Patreon if you would like, 
Or if you're interested in tarot readings or private lessons, you can DM me or text me at 503-893-4606. So um, I've done a lot of um, private lessons. Sometimes I call them study sessions or consultations or whatever. Uh, but it's been really cool just to connect with people and talk symbolism, you know? So if this is something you're into, you know, reach out and let me know if you want to meet up and we can chat. Um, so that's going to do it. Uh, yeah, I got a lot off my chest. So thank you for being here. If you stuck around this whole entire time, that is awesome. Um, I'm going to check the chat briefly and just see, you know, what's going on, who's hanging out, you know, things like that. But I don't think I'm going to make it like this big Q and a sort of thing. Uh, but let's see what's going on here. So cool. I see that there's 40 people watching. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Uh, nice. So I have to give shout outs. That's the thing. Whenever I see the chat, I'm like, you know, uh, Gordy's here. Cozy Crone is here. Pedro's here. Dude, what is up, man? That's awesome. Um, Slick is here. Uh, Snake is here. A change of heart. Thank you for being here. Uh, PK, what's up? JLo, thank you. Tim Nizzle. So a lot of familiar faces. That's really, really cool. Um, you know, I get so jealous of like what's going on in the chat because I'm kind of, uh, you know, I kind of uh, phase in and out of being a chat rat as uh, Slick has once told me that he is. <laughs> and so uh, I'm always curious just like what's going on there because I know there's a lot of brilliant people here. I say that like every single live stream, but there really truly are. Um, some really decent people, some really sharp people. So awesome. Oh, Jenny B what's going on? Uh, Michael, thank you for being here. Very, very cool. Um, so I think that's going to do it guys. Uh, oh, Lucas is here. Thanks, man. Uh, you guys are seriously all like very, very much appreciated. Um, as I said, some really, really sharp cats in the house. Uh, Joshua, what's up, man? So um, that's going to do it. Thank you. You guys are great. And uh, enjoy your weekend. And there will definitely be more presentations down the road because I'm like digging this format uh, for a lot of different reasons. And so uh, more to come. Absolutely. Oh, hey, Debbie. <laughs> more cool people just showing up and showing some love. So all right, guys. Until next time. Take care.